just to take up the, the, the quotation, never say never a little bit, uh, with David. Uh, Peter Brook is my great hero when it comes to the summer, to the Northern Ireland peace process. Uh, he did more than any Secretary of State to bring, it, to bring about a settlement. Uh, he became Secretary of State in 1989, and after 100 days, he gave uh, an interview to the Belfast Telegraph. Now, most uh, Secretaries of State ruled out the possibility of any of any talks with Sinn Féin. Uh, so we just ruled it out as ever possible. Uh, what Brooke said was, you should never say never. And he recalled the fact that one Henry Hopkinson, in 1954, had said about the Cyprus problem, uh, he had said it actually not directly about Cyprus, he had said, but his words were taken to mean Cyprus, he had said there are some colonies which for strategic reasons can never be given independence. That was the context of Never Say Never. And Brooke was referring back to it, and Brooke was saying, applying into the possibility of Sinn Féin in certain circumstances coming into negotiations. The other thing that Brooke said in, the, in his 1989 interview, previous Secretary of State on appointment had always said that they would hammer the IRA, they would smash it into destruction, they would squeeze it like a tube of toothpaste from the Secretary of State and said. And Brooke actually said something different. He said, actually, the IRA cannot be defeated. They cannot military be, be defeated. They can continue. We don't have the power to stop them continuing. However, he said, their political violence is winning them nothing. They're not gaining anything by continuing the armed struggle, which is the word armed struggle. They're not, they're not gaining anything by continuing with the, the campaign of violence. Uh, there was a very subtle message. I think he's a very subtle and interesting individual, uh, 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 Peter Brooks. I think he's quite an interesting character. But that's sidetracking from the main theme of David's uh, presentation, which was on civil society. Although, in an earlier version, you were going to talk about peace without reconciliation, which I think is a very good catchphrase to describe our cold peace in Northern Ireland. However, the paradox of civil society, again, you may not want to know this, it may not be terribly good news, but civil society in Northern Ireland played a great role in pushing for a settlement. The moment there was a settlement, civil society was finished as a political influence. So, under direct rule, civil society had a lot of influence. The reason it had a lot of influence was that under direct rule, ministers wanted to consult somebody in Northern Ireland to legitimize what policies they were pursuing. Generally, the political parties weren't too sympathetic to what the British were doing, so they used civil society. So ministers would talk to elements in civil society. If you're an NGO, you could, you could be given the minister's phone number, you could phone up. Civil society was consulted all the time. The moment we had devolved government in Northern Ireland, civil society, the, the telephone numbers changed, and civil society was out of, out of the picture. The politicians wanted to take over, and they didn't want civil society and NGOs in the picture at all. So it's great irony what's happened to civil society under our settlement. Probably, I don't know whether I should be telling you that, but I'm going to tell you that. Uh, can I, quick, I haven't got much time, so let me move on quickly to South Africa. Again, let me add a bit of spikiness to the story. Um, I think it's very well told, uh, and I agree with most of it. But the South African transition wasn't peaceful. 20,000 people died in political violence between Mandela being released from prison and Mandela becoming president. They didn't, 20,000 people didn't die for no reason at all. There were political strategies in place. The National Party assumed when it, when it, when it went into negotiations that the ANC was in a very weak position. They assumed it was in a weak position because of its alliance with the South African Communist Party. And by the way, most whites in a non-racial ANC come via the South African Communist Party. If you want to be in the ANC and you're white, you better be a member of the Communist Party. Or oh, better have an association with the Communist Party. And the, the National Party assumed that uh, the discrediting of communism would mean that the ANC would be discredited. They also miscalculated on Mandela. Mandela had become a mythic figure in prison. Uh, he was unknown, unphotographed, etc. And they thought that once they released him, he would become a human being with flaws, etc., and they would exploit that, and that Mandela could be brought down to size. So the, the National Party thought it could win the transition, and they thought with a bit of judicious aid to the Nkata Freedom Party to weaken the ANC by direct violence, that this would work in their favor. So 
they didn't go into the transition with a compromise and giving power over to the ANC in mind. They went into the transition with the idea that they could weaken the ANC to the point where they could get the kind of settlement they wanted, which would enshrine a white minority veto. So they didn't go in with the expectation of the result they had. They discovered that the violence actually weakened them in the process. So the National Party's negotiation position weakened dramatically between 1990 and 1994. Answering the paradox as to why when the ANC was perceived as so weak in 1990 did it emerge as the dominant political party in South Africa in 1994 and has remained the dominant party ever since. I've probably said enough uh, for discomforting nature.